Oh, thank you. Okay, well, if it's okay, everybody, we will go ahead and um, call the meeting to order, get started here. And um, for roll call, I think um, we are all here except for Megan and Susie is going to be late. So um, it's great. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, and also just wanted to mention, you've all seen that um, we have a member of the public, Sheila Conroy is joining us again. She says she's just gonna listen, but if you wanna make comments, Sheila, please let us know if you have something you'd like to add. I will, thank you. Um, first thing um, is approval of the last month's minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review? Um, if someone would like to make a motion to approve those, that would be great. This is Chris, I move to approve. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Thomas? Hi, Chris. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye and raise your hand or all opposed. Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, um, moving on um, to the uh, proposed accessions. Eric, if you'd do the honors. All right, so we have a couple of accessions this month. Uh, the first one is um, photographs and a program from the Longmont High School class of 1938. So. For a long time, this was kind of standard in high school is everybody would hand out their uh, senior pictures with their name on them and maybe a note if they knew the person. Um, so we have quite a number of years of, of these in the collection. So uh, every time I'm offered, then I go back and check to make sure we're not just duplicating an existing collection. And so in this case, you know, we took about half, I think, of what was originally um, in the collection, because we had examples of other ones. Um, and then the, the program is from a, uh, a musical called Carmelita that uh, was put on on my high in 1938. Any questions on that accession? If not, we can move to the next one. Um, so this is a, a fun kind of diverse collection. So the, both the donor and her children were heavily involved in 4-H. Um, so we have a scrapbook created by the donor of her experiences, just sort of a general scrapbook of her life, but I have, I've opened it in this photo to the uh, page that shows her, you know, grooming horses and so forth. A little hard to see on the screen, but that is what uh, what that particular page on the left is showing. Um, and then she also um, raised sheep in 4-H and entered them in the fair. And up at the top, that is a pair of uh, sheep shears that are actually sheathed in a piece of a milking machine. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting uh, reuse of... Uh, agricultural item. And then the uh, ribbons actually were won by her children. So the ribbons date primarily from the 1980s. Um, but uh, we really don't have, surprisingly, that many uh, Boulder County Fair ribbons and, and really not many at all from, from a more recent time period. So it seems an appropriate uh, accession. So uh, questions on that accession? All right, I believe that is the last one. Mm. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions or um, comments about the accessions? Okay, do I hear a motion to um, approve the accession of those items? This is Bryden, I'll make a motion to approve these items. Bryden, thank you, is there a second? This is Chris and I'll second. Chris, thank you. 
Uh, all in favor of um, accessioning these items, please raise your hand, wave, whatever. Um, all opposed? Okay, the accession is approved. And now, Kim, if you would give us the director's report, please. Oh, sure. Um, I think you guys all got a copy of this. Um, so I'm just going to kind of pull out some of the highlights in the report um, and not necessarily read every single in for you. Um, so starting there under administration, we were able to get the fund development manager position approved and um, Joanne shared that job description with you. So please share that with anybody that you think might be um, interested in the position. Um, this is gonna be a really big step for us. We've had for some time, uh, uh, Joan has been in the position as three quarter time doing marketing membership and the development. And so having a full-time development person who's gonna be really focusing on fundraising is gonna be a, a serious game changer for us. And um, as you recall, that is funded through the bump that we got from SCFD and the tier two funds. Um, so uh, that took a little bit of time to get sorted out through um, the budget office and through the city manager's office, but it's finally been approved. And so we'll, we'll be hiring for that position very soon. Um, again, you may recall that through our strategic plan, this was really the number one priority that was identified through that process. And so we're, we're excited to be moving forward with that. We've got um, all kinds of marketing that's happening for programs that are going on. Um, and just as an FYI, uh, just on Tuesday, uh, Joan returned from maternity leave. So um, we'll, we'll be kind of rolling back into her, her uh, position in that, but we ha are maintaining uh, Scott Yoho, who was funded through the NEH grant um, until the end of the season, basically. And so he's going to continue to help with us with the um, virtual programming. So that's that's a good thing to have that extra help with that extra um, uh, job that we've got. Our education department um, has had their first Art and Sip on Facebook Live. Um, and so Lee Putman was uh, facilitating that on February the 3rd and everything went smoothly. Some of these things you might, if you've been watching some of our virtual program, there can be some glitches, but I, so far I, th I think it's pretty charming. Um, we do have volunteers that are working on the Discovery Days kits, and so that program is still going quite strong. Uh, we're uh, gonna be distributing probably 90 of those. Um, and that's basically for curbside pickup. So that's that program has really been very strong through the pandemic. So that's been a, a good success story for us. Um, and then we continue to work um, with SVVSD um, on third and fourth grade history projects. And so, you know, they're um, um, kind of trying to navigate it exactly how they are opening up has been a little bit of a challenge, but we're still moving on those um, collaborations. So that's going to be, I think, a really um, great once we are able to unroll that. And we do have, as you may recall, um, the Vista volunteer that's working with us, Courtney Fletcher, and she's been a fantastic addition to our team, just by the way. Um, and she's now working on teacher trunks and sort of um, redeveloping um, those that have been in operation for some time now. And so we're just sort of taking a new look at those teacher trunks and um, uh, sort of upgrading them a little bit. And I know that Susie has used these in the past and knows other teachers who have. Um, so I do think that they're really um, well received. And so we're just trying to up update some of the content in those. Um, and then we also, um, I hope some of you were able to attend the um, uh, opening reception, our virtual opening reception for the Impressionist exhibition. And so included in here um, is that Jared and Anne had a great live discussion about lithography. And I thought it was fantastic. They just had such great banter and were able to really speak passionately about their knowledge. Um, so I was really moved by their presentation during that. I thought it was really lo lovely. 
Um, let's see, on to the collection section there. Um, Eileen and Eric have been working on doing, um, doing some research for a new collections management system. Um, I don't know if you, either one of you want to hype in to talk about that a little bit. This is, this is really a pretty big undertaking. Um, so maybe I'll let Eric talk about that for just a second. Yeah, I mean, we've been using Past Perfect in one version or another since 1998. It has been our database that tells us where everything is, tracks all of the information about our collection. Um, and so replacing it is a, is a big deal. And Eileen and I have been working on, you know, we've, we've had sales pitches now from I think five different companies um, and have demo versions of I think four of those to start looking at, you know, and the reality is there's not going to be a perfect system that's like, this does absolutely everything we wanted. It's, you know, we're, we'll, we'll have to make a choice based on what, what works best. Um, but the big change is that they are now all um, cloud-based, which means right now, you know, we've been able to continue working because we can remote in, but there's no way for volunteers to continue working um, or work on things from home because the city doesn't like volunteers remoting into its system for security reasons. So a cloud-based system means a volunteer could log in from anywhere and and work on you know their project as long as they had you know whatever information or digital images or so forth to work from. So that's going to be a, a big jump for us. And then just the the way that the technology has advanced in terms of being able to do things far more efficiently than than they could a few years ago will I think uh, help help advance uh, not just the collections, but really how the collections are used by, by everybody throughout the museum. So we're excited about it. It never ceases to amaze me why it's so difficult to get a good day of the right fit for a database. But this is an ongoing museum challenge. Like this does, everybody faces this. But I'm, I'm excited to get something new too. I think it'll be great. Um, and then also Eric included in that collection section that there's um, a lot of activity going on with the 150th anniversary and he is on a, a committee to um, sort of uh, represent the museum for that citywide effort. But I do think that a lot of what's happening is happening at the museum. Um, and that's largely as a result of the coronavirus. I think, you know, we, we were already doing things. For instance, Eric was writing a book, you know, um, and we were going to be doing the exhibition regardless. Um, so we kind of are the um, seat of those um, celebrations. Um, but there there are some citywide things that are going to be happening. And so um, we're working to get those together and make that um a great celebration. If you chimed in to the um, birthday event, I thought that that was actually quite amazing to have, you know, Chino represented and to have um, Guzman represented and Vance Brand on there. It was just so much fun to be able to see all of those things. I was really heartened by that happy birthday event. And um, so I hope you guys got to tune into that. And if you didn't tune into it, I highly recommend that you go back to our YouTube Chan, what do we have it on? It's on 880, or you can see it on our um, Facebook page. Um, so you can find it if you if you want to take a look at it. It was really fun. Um, in the exhibits uh, section, there we um, have been helping. Um, you know, there they have renovated the uh, council chambers, and as a result of that renovation, they had to move the mayor's photos. And so we helped out. Um, I say we. It was our exhibits. Uh, staff that helped um, remount those and sort of get them prepared for this new space and, and beautified in a new way. Um, we have the Enduring Exhibition, Enduring Impressions Exhibition that is um, open now and attendance has been actually quite good, which we were really hoping for. Um, and the, in addition to the Enduring Impressions exhibit is also um, in our little portal uh, gallery, we've got um, lithography, art, and process. 
And so um, BRAC really took that on as an exhibit and we borrowed material from uh, the CSU printmaking department for that. Um, and then it also contains a video from MoMA about the lithography process. So again, if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibit yet, um, make sure to check that part of it out. Um, we do have a, an attendant, a, a, a security guard that is um, in the gallery for all of our open hours. So we've got extra security in the space for um, this, you know, sort of high dollar exhibition that we have in there. And then we also have interns working um, with the exhibits department, Ainsley, Wat Ainsley Watkins and Emily Asaf, and they're both CU students. Um, and Jared really relies on these folks um, for a lot of assistance and they do, they're able to do some really great development and design. Um, and so I think that he, he provides a really great opportunity for the, the students that work with him. We're also working with BMOCA on an exhibition um, that'll open in 2023 if I if memory serves um, and uh, that's really kind of getting off in terms of development um, we're working we've got a, a guest curator that is um, pulling that together as well and basically the idea is that it'll be um, a collaboration between an artist and a farmer and there'll be um, some installations at the Longmont Museum. There'll be installations at um, BMOCA in Boulder. And then there'll be installations um, between the two museums on farms. So we're kind of excited about what kind of dialogue that's going to um, generate and what kind of um, you know, ideas that we'll be able to bring into that exhibition. You guys stop me if you have any questions, but I am looking this way. So you might need to say something to get my attention. Um, let's see, we've got in the Stewart Auditorium um, with CARES Act dollars, we were able to get some new equipment um, and the, that's now been um, mounted. And so we've got new cameras and new um, uh, recording equipment in order to be able to do the live streaming in a more seamless way. And so that's up and running and we'll also be able to um, use that for any rental clients that we have. So far, rentals are still kind of slow going um, because of restrictions with coronavirus, but um, we're starting to see a little bit of uptick with that as well. Uh, let's see, uh, Justin mentions here again, the Enduring Impressions um, opening and that we were able to have um, a pianist play at our beautiful grand piano. And it was really, really beautiful in that space. Um, and Simon Zalkin was there um, kind of giving an introduction to the exhibition and to the mowers who are the collectors. Um, I thought it was really a fun um, opening, you know, it, the, the what we were able to pull off in these weird times this virtual opening, I think turned out to be quite a nice thing to do. Um, and Simon was extremely complimentary. He felt like it was um, elegant and very classy. And, and I felt like it was really great kudos um, under the circumstances. Let's see. Um, we've also sort of reinvigorated the Friday afternoon concerts. Um, and so that the first one started on February the 5th. And so those are going to be continuing. Um, Justin's really put together a lot of interesting programs um, kind of going forward. So we've got vo the Voices of Change that happened on the 11th, um, the History of Race and Social Justice in Longmont. Um, Sue Chiatro celebrating 50 years, which is also, um, so we had the, the director, um, uh, what is it, executive director, and then also the poet laureate, um, Bobby Lefebvre, who are, he has, is also a playwright. So they're going to be um, on that program together. Um, then we've got the in-car series, The Air We Breathe, um, Divided We Stand on the Future of Democracy. Um, and so I do think that part of what he's doing is really trying to reach out to make the programming uh, much more diverse. And then also, um, really thought provoking. And so I've been really pleased with the programs that he's been pulling together. And then of course, we do have a couple of up upcoming rentals. The Longmont Symphony Orchestra is going to be doing a taping. So no um, audience, but doing a taping um, on the uh, Longmont, um, I'm sorry, in the Stewart Auditorium. And then the Greater Boulder Youth Orchestra is also going to be doing some taping. Um, so attendance for the new exhibition has been quite good. Um, Elizabeth mentions in this section under the visitor services. So January the 29th was opening day. 
Um, and we had um, 28 that day. And then Saturday was 73. And then Saturdays um, have been close to sold out or sold out so, thus far. So we've been doing quite good. And so I think we opened it up just a little bit more um, to allow more tickets to be available. So we're seeing some really good attendance to the exhibition. So that's very good for us. We're, we're happy to see that. Um, Elizabeth and um, some of the other people on staff has, have also been working with Longmont Police Department in order to be able to create a security pro protocols um, with the exhibition on site. And so we've, we feel good about um, the attention that we've been getting from police and facilities um, in terms of making sure that we've got great um, security for this exhibition. So that's been a, a great collaboration that we've been able to pull off. There's also, she's continuing to sell mystery bags from the Day of the Dead um, uh, merchandise that she still has left. And so that's been going quite well. Um, and then we are still working on um, the attendance numbers from 2020 because of the virtual attendance um, for all of these programs that we took online. And um, I'll just uh, extend that thought a little bit further that SCFD, as you know, requires us to keep track of all of our attendance. Um, and they are, are pretty rigid about how you know, what counts for what kind of attendance and um, how it has to be documented and all of these things. And they haven't come out yet to tell us more about how they are counting virtual attendance, um, but they are putting a lot of um, thought and uh, kind of policy behind it because all of these organizations are in the same boat. All of the cultural facilities are in the same boat in terms of um, having to move all of their programming online during the pandemic. And so they will at some point come out with um, more guidance about how we count what for attendance for um, uh, during the time that we've had things go online. Um, but so far what we've seen is that we actually had more attendance during the pandemic than we did prior. We, we are seeing numbers that are well over 75,000 um, in terms of people who have uh, participated in our programming online. So I think that regardless of what that ends up looking like in terms of SCFD counts, um, we're feeling really great about the um, engagement that we saw during the pandemic and, and with these online programs. Um, and you know, the thing that happens with online programs is it's not just people who can come to the door, but it's people from across the country and across the world who are also able to participate. So that's really been you know very heartwarming to see a lot of that action happening. In our public places, we've got new commissioners there. Um, and so uh, Angela is working to do um, orientations with them and and, um, you know, they really are a working board. And so what she's devised is basically um, a sort of mentor-mentee um, relationship so that there's some training that's happening um, for those new commissioners. Um, and then there's also a new task force to work on LDDA and Creative District um, Project. Um, so you may recall that we've been talking about a cultural plan for some time. And so um, Art in Public Places actually is... Um, this is the year that they are revisiting their strategic plan. And so as a result of that, we decided to just combine all of those efforts. And so Art and Public Places is going to be spearhead, spearheading the cultural plan from here on out. Um, and so at some point, I hope um, that you'll see some invitations to be um, uh, invited to participate on um different kinds of surveys and hopefully focus groups and things like that. Again, timing is a little uncertain yet um, and they, they need to um, secure a consultant before um, there's a lot that becomes clear. But hopefully a lot of this activity will happen when we're actually able to meet in person again. So that'll be a very good thing to have happen um, so we can collect some data and try to understand what people want from arts and culture in Longmont. And then she's also working on the Sister Cities collaboration, um, which is going to be a project at Wartman Park. And that is um, basically a collaboration that celebrates the um, Sister City that uh, uh, partnership that we have with Guzman, um, Mexico. And so um, 
there's they're going to be a call to artists to get that one off the ground. And Wartman Park is actually um, in the process of being built. And so they were able to sort of get in on the ground level of that project to be able to make sure that that gets integrated into the building of that park. So that's all I have on my director's report. Any questions from anyone? Okie dokie. Cool, thank you. Um, sure. I have, it's uh, just uh, one little report I'd like to give um, as a chairman just so you all have a feel for some things that are happening with membership. Um, we sent out um, 428 renewals today to people who either were behind or um, the, you know, whose memberships were coming up for renewal soon. Um, the last time we sent them out was last November. So we kind of tried to give people a break since we, you know, you're not quite sure what's happening with people's money and all that. But, but the thing that I found most interesting, Joanne got some numbers for me today and our current um, membership number is 577. Um, and in April of 2019, so almost two years ago, we had 757. So we're only down 180 from that. And then what I thought was most interesting, we're really only down 89 memberships, current memberships from last year in February, which was kind of prior to all of the pandemic stuff. So, you know, we've had really um, a lot of people who have renewed their memberships, you know, without getting a renewal and who just have continued to support the museum. So I think that that says a lot um, for the programming that we're doing and just in general for people wanting to support the museum. So I just wanted you guys to, to know some of those numbers just to, I think we're doing very well. And I know when we look at some of the other museums that are really, really struggling, I think we should be very happy about where we're sitting. I might add to that, that, um, or I can't remember if I told you guys, but there was, there's that state fund, um, arts relief fund that was available mm -hmm. for Colorado and, we applied for it and we did not get it. And I am actually fine with that because they clearly were trying to target organizations that were on the verge of closing their doors. The application basically had questions like, do you have enough money to pay your staff next week? And things like that. So I felt like, you know, we are really in quite good shape. And I think that um, we should all feel really good about, you know, how the city has 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 really protected us and, and gotten us through this crisis. So um, I feel very good about that. Um. Okay, so um, I don't think we have any old business unless someone is aware of something that didn't make it on the agenda. Um, for new business, the first thing, I actually have a second thing too, but um, has to do with the fact that the city's attor city attorney's office has asked all boards to augment their bylaws um, with the addendum, um, the electronic participation policy during city of Longmont board and commission meetings and I think there was a copy of it in your packet so you could see what it was. Basically, uh, I think we're just trying to um, confirm that what we've already been doing is part of the bylaws. Uh, so um, by the next meeting, we'll know better exactly what form that's gonna take because we're not sure if it's just gonna be a, a line item in the current bylaws that will refer to an addendum or if this whole thing will be included in the, the bylaws. Uh, but what I would ask is that maybe we approve the adoption of this augmentation um, and then we'll figure out how the logistics of how it's actually going to um, be included in those bylaws in which we can update the next month. So um, I could read through this, but I'm going to assume that you all have taken a look at it. Basically, it's just a policy that's in place for emergency circumstances, which I think the pandemic um, falls into that. And it's just um, essentially validating what we're already doing. So if somebody would like to move that we would uh, augment our bylaws by adding this into it, I would appreciate it. This is Chris, I'll move. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? This, this is, is Brad. Oh. oh, 
Wait, we got it. Go for it, Rhea. Rhea? Okay. Thank you, Rhea. And all in favor, please raise your hand. And opposed. Okay, that's approved unanimously. Um, and then the second thing that's not on here that I just wanted to mention, um, and for those of you who've been on the board for a little while, you have probably maybe have seen this already. Um, but one of the things that is usually done with a board is to give tours and to make board members more familiar with whether it's curators at the museum or just different things that the museum does. And since we can't do that, um, we thought that perhaps in future meetings, what we'll try to do is maybe have some of the different curators at the museum um, give presentations or perhaps virtual tours of, of the areas where they work, just so that some of you can um, get a closer view of what's happening um, at the museum with different uh, staff members. So we just wanted to kind of give you a little idea of what um, we're gonna to try to do. Uh, I say we, of course, I'm using that very loosely because I have nothing to do with it, um, but um, it seems like it would be nice. And, and maybe I know there was a, a virtual tour of the collection center that perhaps we could see part of that or something like that too. So that for those people who've never seen the collection center, um, they could get an idea what that looks like. So um, with that said, that's all I have. Are there, does anybody have comments or? Go ahead. I have another item to add if we're ready for that. Um, I had hoped to be able to get this on the agenda but I needed to do a little bit of investigation before um, I added it and I didn't get that concluded until today. Um, so I apologize that it didn't appear um, earlier on the agenda, but um, we have been working as part of the Longmont 150 exhibition. Um, we had been, I say we, again, really this is Eric, has been working on getting um, a land acknowledgement um, statement um, on behalf of the museum together. And he has been working with a, a consultant um, Montoya Whiteman, who is um, both, uh, uh, she is Cheyenne and Arapaho, is that right? Yeah, she's Cheyenne and Arapaho, um, which are the tribes that are most closely um, affiliated with L Longmont. And so she's done a lot of really, really wonderful research for us and has put together a lot of documentation about land acknowledgements and um, kind of how they're used and how they've been developed. Um, and so just to give you a little bit more information about them, um, if you're not aware of them, land acknowledgements basically are a statement um, that recognizes the Native Americans who whose land you're sort of operating on. And they've become really quite... Um, I don't want to use the word popular because it, it sounds a little derogatory, but but they are being adopted more and more as sort of best practices in museums and in other areas as well. I, it's my understanding, and this comes from um, Montoy's research, that they really developed um, out of Australia and the indigenous um, people in Australia. And, um, and so they're used in a lot of different arenas, um, but uh, certainly museums and especially cultural museums have been adopting them very frequently lately. And so um, in part of what we've been talking about um, with Montoya is that she brought to our attention that the city council of Denver actually adopted um, a statement that they read before every council meeting in Denver. And, um, and so, you know, it, it, it became an option for us to start thinking about, should we, should we expand this conversation beyond just the museum and talk about it in terms of the city of Longmont and the city council of Longmont? And so that's really the research that I had to do is to talk to my boss, Karen Roney, about how would be the best sort of avenue to achieve that goal. And she then needed to um, talk to the city manager to try to understand better what would be the best way to do it. And I think we all have come to the conclusion 
that it's you guys who get to, um, to help us navigate this, that to try to understand better what, what might be the best process, um, what, how we might be able to um, develop the actual statement, um, who should be involved, um, and, and how we kind of want to move forward with it. As I mentioned, and, and Eric, I don't know if you want to um, pipe up here to talk about some of the research that Montoya has done. I think that she has really informed this conversation um, a lot. And so I, I think we've got a really great foundation for continuing the conversation. Eric, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I think, yeah, I think what you've said is, is absolutely right. That, that we've really been, been lucky to get uh, Montoya's thoughts on this. Um, uh, she has a lot of amazing connections, um, just people all over the country. And um, so I think it's a really good resource. And um, she's also working with the Denver Art Museum on a similar project. They're also looking at a land acknowledgement statement. So um, I think, yeah. um, I'm sure, you know, if, if you all would want, I could, we could send her, send you all some of the information that she's provided to us about land acknowledgements, what they are, what, what purpose they serve, and things like that as a starting point. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd be very interested in that. It's, it's something that we typically do in higher education as well. Starting any of our meetings or presentations, we'll talk about acknowledging the land before we go into those presentations, so. We've been doing it pretty informally at the museum, um, but you know, go, developing this exhibition, and in fact, you know, even Eric writing the book, um, it just made every sense in the world to acknowledge what happened before Longmont was here, you know, before there was this, um, this thing called Longmont, you know? And so um, I think that, that it all just makes, you know, it's very logical to be able to, to look further back than that um, and acknowledge who was here before us. Um, and so I, it's unclear to me, you guys, exactly what needs to happen, but I think probably Eric's right that the first step is for us to share um, Montoya's research with you. Um, and then and then what we need to do is really kind of navigate what a process would look like. Um, it, Susie, I'm sure has an opinion on this as well. So maybe we linger just a little bit longer until um, she's able to join us. Um, but I do think that the, the key is going to be to um, figure out the best route to get it to city council. And write in the statement. That's the other thing. We have to actually write the statement. Eric, do you want to talk about Montoya's um, thoughts about that? Um, so if, if you haven't heard a, a land acknowledgement statement, they really run, run the gamut. But, but a, a typical one might be something to the effect of, you know, we acknowledge that the land we are speaking to you from is the traditional homeland of the Cheyenne and the Arapaho peoples. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that type of thing. Uh, Montoya is really advocating for it, going a little further than that, not just acknowledging it, but actually having some kind of a call to action. And it's like, well, that's fine, but what are you going to do about it? And so, She's, she is talking that, that there should be something in terms of, and this is a way that you can react to that. Um, so um, that is one of the things that um, we, you know, kind of need to wrestle with, and, and particularly as a city where it's like, well, we can't really say, and we think everyone should give to this organization because a city can't really say that in quite the same way that, say, a private museum might might be able to make that type statement, but um, but it it just you know it raises awareness, but it you know it also is an opportunity I think to throughout the organization talk about you know what does it mean to be um, living on what what our um, what on our gallery we say we are squatters on Indian land. Um, and uh, that um, is a, uh, 
you know, something that, that uh, it's, it's sometimes a hard truth to, to deal with, but uh, I think it's an important one to wrestle with. And in some ways it's, it's that writing of it almost and the, the outreach and, and getting a group involved that is you know, as big a part of it almost as the final statement. The final statement is, is you know, a good piece, but, but you need to have buy-in from a large enough group where it's not just seeming like, oh, the museum wants us to read this, so we're gonna do it, um, where it really becomes something that the, the organization as a whole has, has agreed to. Kim, we're not able to hear you. Sorry, um, I don't necessarily want folks to have to linger um, to wait for um, Susie. So maybe what I'll do is just make sure that she sees the recording of, of this meeting. And then um, we'll, sh we'll make sure to share all of the materials with her as well. Um, but I do think maybe by the next um, advisory board meeting, if we can come up with a, a good strategy for a process um, and then, you know, stakeholders who we want to be involved with it um, and sort of how we want to um, arrive at a final statement. I think it will be a good thing for us to be able to do. Great. That sounds good. I look right, forward to seeing that information. So right. if anybody, nobody else has anything to um, add at this point, um, is there a motion to adjourn? Thomas, Thomas, and is there a second? Dale, thank you. All in favor? All opposed? Okay, well, thank you all. Um, I have 515 and um, we'll see you next month. Thank you very much. Bye. Awesome. Bye you. everyone. Bye. Thank you, Sheila. Bye.